All right, welcome to part nine of my series looking at Russ Miller's 50 Facts versus Darwinism in the Textbooks. I'll get started. We were talking about viruses. Have you ever heard that AIDS will evolve and or the bird flu will evolve to where the uh, antibiotics we have today will not be effective on them? So I hate to nitpick here, Russ, but um, antibiotic are absolutely useless against viruses. Antibiotics aren't used to treat viruses. Um, there's antiviral agents, but antibiotics are specifically for things like microbes, bacteria, and fungi, living things, hence the name antibiotics. May seem like an unimportant distinction, but one of, here, here, here's a clue. This is, this is a free tip from me to you. Um, when you're attempting to sound like you know what you're talking about, it's really important to use the right terms for things, the right words, the, um, you know, when you consistently make huge errors, um, as you've done so far and as you're continuing to do here, um, it gives those of us who actually know about this material cause to believe that you may not know what you're talking about at all. Actually, there's no evolution here whatsoever, which shows their desperation and the fact they throw it out there as an example. I'm curious as to why you don't consider the changes in the um, genome of a population of viruses to be evolution. It's, um, it involves all of the principles of natural selection, evolution. Um, it involves uh, mutation. It involves differential reproductive success. Viruses multiply very rapidly and accumulate lots of genetic losses, genetic losses due to mutations. Now these are micro changes within the same kind of virus or bacteria, but a micro change due to the loss of information can still create a worldwide pandemic out of what was just a small health risk. For instance, scientists create antibodies to attach to certain proteins in viruses or bacteria and destroy them. A little more hair splitting. Scientists don't create antibodies. Antibodies are large proteins created by your body's immune system. Um, they're not, they're not man-made. Let's say that, as an example, the protein were shaped like this. Well, the antivirus would be a mirror image that attaches to that protein and then destroys the whole body. However, if the virus has a mutation and when it's forming, it can't straighten out, so now it's shaped like this, as opposed to this. Let's say it can't straighten out. It's lost that information. Now the antibody can't recognize it and attach to it. And a small health risk can become a, a worldwide health concern. But it evolved nothing. That's caused by the loss of information. And for evolutionists to try to tell people that's a proof of evolution proves to you that they have no real evidence for Darwinian change. Now your hand analogy is is fairly good. That's 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 a fairly good one, and uh, and I'll probably use that when teaching. It's actually quite good. It's it's a better it, it's better than the key and lock mechanism one the discussion example that I've used in the past when teaching bio intro to biology. Um, so I will use that. Thanks. Um, and in fact, your thumb, you know, the protein not unfolding or not folding the same way, producing a slightly different a mutation with a loss of information or whatever, if you want to call it that, that won't no longer fit um, the the specific protein receptor on on the antibody. Um, that's also fairly good. But what you're leaving out is that's one mechanism. That's one way that a virus, a protein on a virus, can change. Um, what if it adds a sixth finger? using the hand example. Um, six fingers, the five-fingered uh, key lock won't fit anymore, okay? I mean, if that makes sense. It will no longer attach to it. It can't attach um, because it doesn't recognize the new information. Um, and that happens a as well. I'm going to direct you guys to the Los Alamos National Laboratory. Uh, they have a fantastic HIV website um, where, this is really cool, you can download um, hundreds and hundreds of gene sequences for HIV. Isn't that awesome? Um, so we don't have to take Russ's word on it because I'm sure Russ has done, you know, he's, he's, he's done this research. He's, he's adequately demonstrated. He's looked at the ancestral strains of HIV and looked at all the modern strains, all of the resistant strains, and determined that they are missing some DNA as opposed to actually having added new genetic information, right? I'm sure he's done the research. He wouldn't just make that assertion without having actually looked at it, right? Okay. 
Fact is, Russ is just talking out of his ass. Sorry, guy. <laughs> You're full of shit. Um, there are strains that are longer, uh, longer sequences. There's strains that are shorter sequences. There's strains that are significantly larger than other. I mean, it, it it's addition, it's loss, it's it's every possible thing you can think of. Um, these strains have mutated and changed, and there's no none of the drug resistant strains are necessarily any shorter, indicating that they lost information. As you're asserting, you're you're just making stuff up and losing information by the way is evolution too don't this is this is something i was going to point out earlier you make the claim um repeatedly that that's loss of information you're you're you this it's this idea that it's the pine cone crap that a truthful christian was using it's this bigger better stronger concept um that you guys like to attack um sometimes a lot of things i'm um, Look at parasitic worms. Parasitic worms generally are significantly simpler than their closely related non-parasitic forms, um, their ancestral type, okay? Um, they've evolved. They're, they're highly derived. They're highly modified. Um, but they've lost significant things like digest. Some of them don't have a digestive system because they no longer need it, okay? They've evolved by losing information. So it, it can go both ways. Homeobox genes are called Hox genes for short. These are control genes. In other words, the frog has the genetic information to form a, a left rear leg, but a mutation in the Hox gene may cause it to tell it to put the leg in the wrong place. The Hox gene usually guides it to the correct location. So a mutation in the Hox gene could end up with a frog's left rear leg coming out the middle of its back or the middle of its forehead. But this is a change due to the loss of information, and it will not change an amphibian into a reptile. So oftentimes evolutionists will, will claim that Hox mutations lead to evolution. Realize that's just another evolutionary lie. Way to distort good science there, Russ. Um, homeobox genes, first of all, are a hell of a lot more complex than you're, than you're describing, and I, I understand that you're you're speak you're not speaking to a scientific crowd and everything like that. So I'm not I'm not knocking you for for simplifying it. But uh, first of all, a mutation in a hox gene is not going to cause a frog's leg to grow out of its head. That's not how they work. Um, but what the central point about hox genes, homeobox genes that you're missing, um, is that first of no, creationists should really be better off just pretending that hox genes don't exist because the reality is they are a nail in the coffin of creationism they and they are okay uh we've been there there's been so many great research papers on on homeobox genes in in arthropods and polychaetes and in vertebrates i mean it, it's amazing okay how much we know about these genes now i mean it, it's it's orders of magnitude more than we knew just a decade ago. And one of the things that's turning out about them is that, yes, indeed, they they do direct um, som somite function, which is our segmentation. Um, if you look at a vertebrate embryo or any em almost any embryo of, of an advanced um, organism, you see that they, they start forming segments, those segments, the pattern of those segments, and then what grows on each segment is, is really, really important. Um, but the thing that's critical is is that they tell the segment what to grow, um, but they also tell the segment what not to grow. Uh, that's where the that's that's the the, the before mentioned nail in the coffin. Uh, for example, um, if you've got if you've ever seen an insect, uh, you see that an insect has they have six legs, right? You know, on on their thoracic segments. Um, but they also have segments without legs. They have segments that are missing legs. Those segments, turns out, that don't have legs, um, they don't have legs because what happens when they're developing, this is, this is kind of cool, is there's sort of a generic code that says grow segment, grow legs, right? You know, segment, add legs. That's, that's sort of the programming. So they would have legs on every segment except for the fact that the homeobox genes tell that particular segment or those segments, you know, they, they, they some of them, some of the homeobox genes will say segments four through six grow no legs, if that makes sense. When those homeobox genes are removed, they sprout legs on those segments. 
They don't just sprout legs randomly. It's not like it's putting... It's not... They're not telling it. It's not like you, you mentioned there. So the le- what, it, what this means, though, is is that when we, gen- when we look at the genes that form that segment, the genes to grow perfectly fine legs exist on those segments. Why would a creator put genes that will never be expressed? Um, you know, you, you, do you see what, where I'm going with this? Why put the genes there and then have to create a very, very sophisticated and complex molecule, uh, protein, a Hox protein, that tells that gene, never express yourself. Never. Okay? Just grow a segment, grow no legs. Right? Do, do you see where I'm going with that? Um, homeobox genes have been sequenced really, really, uh, it's amazing, in snakes. Um, because if you note, snakes have significantly more vertebrae than other um, tetrapods, but also they have a, sort of a lack of differentiation of, of, in other words, because they don't have a pelvis, for example, uh, the difference in body segmentation before where the pelvis would be and after the pelvis would be has been lost. They, they're fairly um, homologous. Homologous? That's not the right word, is it? Um, they're fairly homogenous. That's the word I was looking for. Uh, from from neck down to tail. And we have sequenced it and found out that these homeobox genes do this. These homeobox genes actually serve to turn off because just like whales, um, just like, uh, uh, well, frankly, a lot of things, um, when these when snakes are embryonically, when they're developing embryonically, they actually grow limb buds. They actually grow... Um, including some of the like bones of the arm and leg and everything. I mean, they actually grow um, these limbs for a short period of time, and the homeobox genes turn them off. Homeobox genes signi- specifically turn off um, the 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 commands to grow limbs. So um, again, your your creator created snakes with the genes to grow completely normal lizard limbs. Uh, which actually have to have a complex apparatus to turn them off. It's a little odd, don't you think? Duplications are random copying errors, duplicating already existing genetic information, not producing new and beneficial genetic data. It would be like a malfunction in a printing press that might print two copies of Chapter 9. You would increase the information, but it would be already existing information. It would not create new and beneficial data. Ignoring, of course, the fact that the copy can then accumulate mutations, uh, therefore adding new information to the genome. Uh, Copy errors, copy mutations are probably one of the more common ways in which new and beneficial information is added to a gene pool. For instance, a fly can have a copying error and end up with four sets of wings but it won't have the muscles or the central nervous system to control and use those wings. They will flop there, and it will not be able to fly at all, which means it will be removed by what? By natural selection. So these mutations are almost always harmful or fatal. Uh, The flies with four wings, not four sets of wings, by the way, the flies with four wings, that's not a copy error. It's not like there's a gene copy that says grow another pair of wings. way to misunderstand really, really basic intro-level biology. Uh, Those are the fact that flies, unlike most insects, only have two wings, one pair of wings. Uh, Their second pair of wings are stunted. They don't grow because of a hox gene that tells them not to grow wings there. Instead, they grow a structure called a haltier that is used in, in maneuvering. It's used for, it's a sort of a gyroscope type thing that they use for for stability in flight when the hox gene is turned off the halters grow into fully developed wings because they have the genetic apparatus in place the genes in place to grow wings there they're just not expressed 